The Second World War to a large degree was determined by the disparity of the economic capacities and the manpower between the Axis and the Allies. Yet solely looking at the production numbers and men can lead to a deterministic or even fatalistic interpretation that prevents us from looking at other factors that also played a vital role in the defeat of the Axis forces. The Japanese leadership was well aware of the limited capabilities in both resources and industrial capacity, yet it failed to unify the two branches of the Japanese armed forces, notably the Imperial Japanese Army and the Imperial Japanese Navy, to focus on one strategy in the years leading to the war. The army for a large part saw its main enemy in Russia and later the Soviet Union, while the navy determined the United States of America as the principal foe. Both branches couldn't agree, and since they were not subordinates of the Japanese government, there was no unifying power to force them into cooperation. This led to two different strategies that were competing with each other for resources, manpower and equipment. This also led to a parallel development of similar aircraft types, like bombers, and prevented the creation of a uniform standard in production. Such inefficiencies and waste of resources are problematic in general, but in combination with limited industrial capacity and resources, such effects weigh several magnitudes higher than for industrial giants like the United States. Let's take a look at the shortcomings of the Japanese Army Air Force. Since it was mostly developed for tactical support of a land war against the Soviet Union, it lacked capabilities for naval navigation and long-range missions, something that was crucial for the use in the Southeast Asia and especially the islands of the Pacific. As a result, the Navy had to fly long-range bombing missions in the Philippines for the Army. One major problem was that the Japanese Army lacked strong advocates for air power in its ranks. This was due to the fact that the Japanese had very limited amount of Army officers with air combat experience, although the Japanese were among the first to use combat aircraft in World War I. But it was only a short and limited engagement in 1914. These experiences were too limited to convince enough officers of the importance of air power. The army initiated two times the creation of an independent air force as a third branch, like Germany and the United Kingdom, yet the navy disagreed, because they feared, that similar to the British RAF, that the fleet air arm would only play a marginal role in an independent air branch. For a short time the army like the navy saw the United States as the main opponent. During that period the development of a large four engine bomber was started. Furthermore, there were projects to use aircraft catapults on land bases in order to circumvent the problem of building long airstrips after an invasion of the Philippines. Yet once the army focused again on Russia and Asia, these projects were discontinued in the early 1930s. Due to the annexation of Manchuria by the Japanese, an extended land border to the Soviet Union changed the strategic situation. Furthermore, the development of the TB-3 bomber by the Soviets put the Japanese home islands in the rage of the Soviet Air Force. Around the mid-1930s, the army started a major expansion of its air arm, and in 1937 declared the destruction of the enemy's air force as the primary mission. Yet in the conflicts in China and with the Soviet Union, the Army Air Force mainly contributed on a tactical level. Furthermore, in 1940, the emphasis on destruction of the enemy air force was weakened, and the offensive power remained mostly on a tactical level. The main problem with Japanese Army aviation lay in the lack of initiative and the conservative senior leadership that was mostly reacting to international developments instead of formulating its own doctrines. This led to a shortage of officers with proper experience during the rapid expansion. To quote from the article, this often resulted in poor leadership and unimaginative staff work, giving rise to operations that were questionable in their effectiveness and all too predictable and conventional in nature. Now before we take a look at the shortcomings of the Imperial Japanese Navy, which were quite different to those of the army, let's take a look at their initial achievements first. The Navy, unlike the Army, had strong advocates for air power in its ranks. This was due to the fact that modern navies usually had a more open attitude towards technology and innovation. After all, an infantry division consists mostly of men, whereas a battleship consists mostly of steel but of a lot of technological components and only a handful of men. The Imperial Japanese Navy was a pioneer in naval aviation. It built the world's first purpose-built aircraft carrier the HIJMS Hosho in 1922. 
Furthermore, it introduced the first operational all-metal monoplane carrier fighter plane in 1937. And in 1940, it was able to perform the mass deployment of torpedo and dive bombers in coordination with fighters launched from several aircraft carriers, something no navy at that time was able to do. Right before Pearl Harbor, the Imperial Japanese Navy had more aircraft carriers than any other navy and had the world's leading naval air arm. Furthermore, there were some other areas where the IGN achieved leading roles. In terms of aircraft, the Zero outmatched all its counterparts and sometimes even land-based aircraft. Additionally, the IGN possessed a strong land-based naval bomber force, the so-called RICO units, which were initially developed to counter the limits on the number of carriers due to the naval treaties. These units sank the Royal Navy battleships HMS Prince of Wales and HMS Repulse. Also, the attack on Pearl Harbor and the following half year, the IGN basically marked the start of the domination of aircraft carriers in naval warfare. Yet, despite all these achievements in naval aviation, it is quite surprising that the IGN didn't drop the battleship as a core weapon prior or after these initial successes of carriers. Its fleet organization still focused on the battleship and it didn't create a complete carrier task force organization, unlike the US Navy later in the war. Although the enormous amounts of resources put into building the super battleships Yamato and Musashi are to a certain degree understandable, because before the war in the Pacific it was not clear how important carriers would be, but the reluctance to change the naval organization was a major flaw. This is also reflected by the presence of the Japanese battleship fleet at the Battle of Midway in June 1942. One major flaw of the Imperial Japanese Navy was its focus to primarily target enemy warships and often ignore the enemy supply ships. Like after the defeat of the Allied cruisers at the Battle of the Sabo Island, where the transport ships were left unharmed. This was not just one incident, the Aichian submarine doctrine focused on destroying enemy warships, as did the Japanese airmen. To some degree this may be hindsight bias, but misjudging the strategic value of merchant ships and supplies probably stemmed from a focus on a classically decisive battle thinking. In defense of the Japanese we need to take into account that even the western allies that focused on a strategic warfare early on didn't focus initially on the German supplies in the bombing campaigns. It took them until May 1944 to focus on fuel production which severely limited the mobility and combat effectiveness of all German forces. In the Pacific, with long supply lines between the islands, the strategic value of attacks against merchant shipping was about as crucial as fuel for Germany. Let's take a look at the Japanese capabilities. As mentioned before, the focus of the Japanese army and navy was on supporting battles. This narrow view led to a neglect of logistics and other crucial elements. Similar to the German Luftwaffe, there was a certain neglect for all elements that didn't surround actual combat. For instance, the Japanese lacked pilots for ferrying aircraft to the front lines, and the capabilities to construct airfields was limited. Furthermore, there was a severe lack of warning and communication equipment, like radar and effective radio sets for fighters. Unlike the German Air Force in Western Europe, the Japanese couldn't rely on existing infrastructure in the Pacific, Thus, these shortcomings reduced the combat effectiveness and readiness of the units furthermore. As a result, naval bombers were used several times to drop supplies, because there were no transport aircraft available. This was in stark contrast to the Allies that airlifted an infantry division from Australia to New Guinea. The lack of mechanized engineering equipment to create and improve existing airfields also had severe long-term effects. It not only resulted in a huge delay and backbreaking labor on the Japanese side, Additionally, the resulting installations were often very limited in size. As a result, Japanese airfields were usually congested with planes that were parked closely to each other. On several occasions, this led to severe losses when those airfields were attacked. Often these attacks occurred without any warning to do the Japanese lack of radar equipment. Although the Japanese were once among the leaders in radar technology, they fell behind by not investing and employing the technology for military purposes. In general, the Japanese efforts and capabilities surrounding communication and coordination were limited. There was a lack of effective shortwave radios, thus Japanese fighter pilots basically communicated with visual signals. 
This prevented to a large degree that they could fully exploit the initial advantages in training and equipment. Furthermore, it also prevented the creation of proper ground or carrier-based control capabilities, like the British used during the Battle of Britain or the US Navy developed throughout the war. Let's take a look at the Japanese priorities and their consequences. The Japanese focus on battle and combat units was a determining factor throughout the war and the lack of unified strategy between the Navy and the Army showed a lack of foresight and strategic perspective. The missing unified strategy prevented a proper and effective allocation of Japan's limited resources before and during the war. In contrast, even the United States that enjoyed an abundance of industrial capacity and manpower still committed to the grand strategy of Germany first with the British. The Japanese aircraft industry lagged behind in terms of powerful engines. This problem was circumvented by using no armor plates and self-sealing fuel tanks in the early models. Due to their experiences fighting the Chinese, although they assumed that these measures were sufficient, unlike the Germans that improved their aircraft after the experiences in the Spanish Civil War. Thus, during the Guadal Canal campaign, Japanese losses increased and the highly trained airmen thinned out quickly. The lack of proper training programs is similar to the Germans and since the Western Allies put a strong emphasis on trainings early on, this soon led to a situation where the average Japanese pilot was less trained than the average Allied pilot. Or as Asamu Tagaya put it, in the end, the initial margin of superior training and experience exhibited by its airmen proved insufficient to prevent serious attrition. Let's take a look at the Japanese aircraft industry. Japan before and shortly after the First World War was dependent on Western technology and imported aircraft and equipment at the time. During the 1930s they reached self-sufficiency in engine and airframe design. But the development circles were still quite long. Furthermore, in aircraft components and subsystems like radios, Japan was still very dependent on Western imports. The duration of the development cycles was a problem Yet, this could have been dealt with by ordering follow-up tires early on. But the Japanese didn't issue specifications for follow-up designs early enough. Prior to April 1942, there was no serious effort invested to create a successor for the Zero Fighter plane. If these measures would have been taken in 1940, then the Japanese could have had an aircraft to counter the Corsair or Hellcat when they arrived, but they still had to fight them with the modified versions of the Zero. Furthermore, the initial successor of the Zero, the A7M Repu, failed and wasn't abandoned soon enough, thus delaying the N1K1J Schieden, which entered combat in October 1944. And its improved version, the Schieden Kai, was ready in March 1945. Hence, even though the development cycles of the Japanese were not as fast as that of the United States, this problem could have been averted by ordering a replacement at an early stage. As a result, at the end of the war, the Japanese only fielded a handful of types that were introduced during the war, whereas the United States replaced a large amount of its pre-war models. These choices led to a situation in 1944 where the Japanese faced highly trained US pilots with new superior planes in their slightly upgraded planes flown by poorly trained pilots. This resulted in an ineffective air force, which had almost no other option than to resort to kamikaze attacks, due to insufficient training and equipment. Note that we are talking about the average pilots here, because those win the war, not a small number of extraordinary aces. To conclude, similar to Germany, Japan wasn't ready for a long war on a global scale in terms of its industrial capabilities. But only looking at the industrial side of a country when it comes to analyzing a war can be misleading, because one might miss important areas of improvement. One way to avoid this is to take a look at the engagements when the economic power of the winning faction wasn't yet the determining factor. For the war in the Pacific, these were the Guadalcanal campaign and the Battle of Midway. In both cases, the Japanese committed various errors and the United States proved to be a skillful enemy, even without superior numbers. Thus the turning point of the war in the Pacific was before the United States could bring its full numerical advantage to the table. 
something that was clearly different from the one Europe. Finally, the Japanese reluctance to move away from their strong focus on combat at the cost of logistics and support played an important role in the reversal after the initial successes. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, share and subscribe. And see you next time.